Good evening and welcome to this month's webinar, Unpacking a Story, presented by the North American Cambridge Classics Project and sponsored by Cambridge University Press. We are so delighted to have Joe Davenport with us here this evening as our guest presenter. Joe's been teaching with the Cambridge Latin course at Norwell Middle School in Massachusetts for more than 40 years. Uh, he's also a member of the NACCP board and the National Latin Exam Writing Committee. He was the former co-chair of ACL's middle school committee, and he's also received ACL's Meritus Award. Joe has done a number of webinars for us throughout the years, and he's also a regular presenter at the NACCP annual CLC Summer Workshop. And he did a session on unpacking a story this past summer, which was very well received. And we felt, feel that it's just very appropriate for him to expand upon that for this webinar this evening. So Joe, it is your presentation. Thank you and welcome to everyone to unpacking a story. Let's get my screen going here. All right. And uh, I'm tonight I'm hoping to cover two or three major topics. Um, the first one being looking at simple ways of lowering affective filters for students by making the story more comprehensible um, by dividing it into smaller, more easily understood sections. And we'll focus on about five or a few more um, readings from each of the units, one, two, and three. Um, and then when we finish that, we'll start to look at eight different ways of approaching uh, these stories with your class, each having varying degrees of student participation um, and involving in different time uh, commitments. Uh, each approach can be used separately or in combination um, with each other. And then at the end, if there's some time remaining, uh, we will um, look at perhaps some ways of going back and revisiting the stories um, for vocabulary or phrasing or even grammatical structures. Um, so let me um, work on my, hang on there. We're going to get the screen somehow to move. There we go. I got what I need now. So, um, Looking at a story like Unit 3's Belemicus Rex, what a student sees is this solid wall of text, and it can be very intimidating for a lot of the students and difficult for them to keep track of where they are in the story and the challenge for their working memory to sort through so many details. A better approach is to break the story into smaller, more digestible sections so a student's short-term memory has more manageable input. Facing too much of the text at once floods students' short-term memories and leaves them prey to what we call the primacy recency effect. This is when too much new input can drive out previous input before the short-term memory is able to make sense of it and pass it on to storage. So students are now presented with just this, okay? Uh, Facing this removes a lot of the intimidation and allows students to work through the meaning of this one section and consolidate it before going on to the next. Through class discussion, the main ideas can be woven into a proper narrative, and then the students' short-term memories are better able to move on to the next section. Um, but this is not just important in those long stage three stories. Um, even in unit two, a story like this, even though it's set up as a play, as dialogue with lots of white space, many students look at it and they go, oh my God, 37 lines. So instead, breaking it into um, shorter beats <laughs> or exchanges uh, makes it easier for them to get through what's happening. So first they see uh, a smaller section where... Um, the main idea is Antiloquox delivers a message. And then they go next to where Quintus doesn't 
understand and needs clarification. And next, Auntie Loquax in the story explains the details. And then the next section, Quintus understands how important this whole thing is. And then next, Auntie Loquax fills in Salius, at which point we stop and wonder, is Salius using this child enslaved child not only as a messenger, perhaps as a spy to keep him informed on all the goings on in his willa. Um, and then finally, Salius does not want to be shown up by a Pompeian nobody, and so on through the story. It's easier to get each one of those ideas firm in the student's mind before they go on to the next. <clears throat> but again, this is even useful in unit one, when students are still so new to the language, even though it's a shorter story, it can still be intimidating with, for them. And the vocabulary can be overwhelming because they have very little vocabulary under their belts at that point. So I would divide this story of Aurus into these sections. <clears throat> we read the um, first paragraph, which gives the setting of the story essentially. And after that, we have a general understanding of that. Then they're ready to move on to the actual action of the story. Oops, excuse me. Um, <clears throat> and even a small paragraph like this four-line paragraph from the middle of um, Aurus can be subdivided sometimes into smaller sections. So what I've done with this part is I've blocked out a part of the text and we read those two lines and I make sure, all right, does anyone understand that? And if no one has any questions, then I go on to the next part so that I can hold the surprise that the thieves feel for them as well. When we reveal the next part, suddenly there's this huge snake lying in the money. Whereas you have the whole story in front of you, then they're skipping right to the end and they already know that. <clears throat> so this helps keep the twist at the end a surprise, and we still get to discuss all four lines. Uh, but this technique is even useful from the very start, again, when all of the vocabulary is new. So, in fact, when I'm doing this first story of Kiberis, um, I break it up into these various sections. Um, I've used this with students as young as sixth graders. And the students are not rushed through the model sentences um, in um, stage one, then that first paragraph of the story can actually be done entirely orally with no text displayed. Uh, a good pacing for that um, is I will do the um, first 10 or 14 captions uh, with the model sentences with the pictures, and then perhaps discuss the culture that's revealed in those pictures and one of the cultural readings. Then on the second day, we'll do the rest of the captions and discuss another of the cultural readings. And then on the third day, we're ready to do this story of Kiberis. And I actually read this whole part to them without them looking at the text. I just had them put their heads down on the desk, close their eyes, listen, and then I give them a moment <clears throat> to talk with um, a partner, discuss what they think they heard, what's going on. Uh, and then we um, they volunteer their answers about what they think is happening. And we sew that together into um, this section of the story. Also having it split up into these smaller sections makes it very helpful for discussing the um, cultural um, parts of the sentence of the story as well. After hearing these first few lines, the story of the story, the students are able to tell me that Tychelius is sitting in the garden, Mattel is reading in the garden. I'm oh, sorry, Luki is reading in the garden. Slave is working in the, a slave person is working in the reception hall and Metella is in the reception hall. But then we get to go beneath the surface and I ask them, well, why is Tychelius in the garden? Well, to relax, that's why you have a garden. And Lucia has been taught to read. Is she perhaps reading to her father? Is he helping her to learn to read? Why isn't Metella out in the garden with them? 
And then they remember, oh yeah, in the cultural reading we did, we read that one of Metella's jobs was to supervise the enslaved people who work in the house. So poor Metella stuck supervising Caecilius and Lucia, uh, uh, supervising the slave while Caecilius and Lucia are out enjoying the garden. Similarly, when we discuss the second half, we talk about um, Quintus and, and the fact that he's writing. What could he possibly be writing? And they have uh, several possibilities come up with, but eventually someone says, well, maybe he's the son, he's doing his homework. And of course, I always say to them, and what's the most important homework to do? Obviously, it's your Latin homework. And then that leads us to the question, well... Latin homework for Quintus would be like, what kind of homework for you? And they come up with, oh, it'd be like our English homework. And then we talk about, well, if Quintus was to study another language, what language would he probably study? And of course, younger students are always want to volunteer English or Spanish or French until I disabuse them of that idea that these were not major languages in the Roman Empire or they didn't exist at that time. Uh, but that many educated Romans were fluent in both Latin and Greek. So that's the language that he would probably be studying. And is the dog out in the street because he's being punished? No, the spiked collar and his lean and mean look kind of indicate he was probably a guard dog. And then actually later on in stage six, we learn the probable reason why Caecilius bought Cabarrus. Um. We go on to the second paragraph, and then they start hitting some of the new vocabulary. So I, I like to show them the text. I will read it to them first and then show them the text. And I can um, display um, the glosses. Sometimes I will just use visual cues. Now, I didn't always do that. Uh, that came over several years. Uh, the first thing I worked on was dividing these stories into smaller sections with the glosses under them. And then I started thinking, oh, maybe I could put some visuals in here. And then I thought, well, it's better to team up a vocabulary word with a visual than with another word, probably. Um, but that's something that takes a long time to do. And so I would say that's a lot to bite off um, in one year. I That was over decades that I started coming up with the idea of trying to use some some visuals. So that's not something that I'm pressing is something you need to do right away. Okay. Um, so these are some of the other visuals and I very quickly are able to make out what these new words mean by just looking at the pictures and the Latin words. And then we discuss what's going on in the story in that particular section. Um, before we had um, laptops and digital editions of the book and monitors to display them in classes. I was already doing this. I would simply um, Xerox the story and cut and paste it in sections with questions under it so that they would be able to just read a smaller section of the story and then answer questions about it. So if you're not big with technology, if your school doesn't have a lot of technology and you aren't able to uh, easily make these slides like I have, then you certainly can find other ways to get around that. So <clears throat> that concludes trying to minimize the overload of input students must deal with when approaching a story of text. So now I want to turn to some of the um, eight or so main ways that I typically use uh, when we look at a story. Um, these can be mixed and matched at will. Uh, there's plenty of day when I will use five or six of these methods in the same class on different parts of the exact same story. So we don't need to read this right now. We're gonna kind of go through them one at a time. So the this method I call um, building a story brick by brick. And the teacher reads a section of the story out loud in Latin to the class. 
with the text usually on the screen. And then um, students volunteer what they know or got out of that story. Um, I would typically read it to them and then give the send them a few minutes in pairs to discuss what they just heard so they can pair thoughts. Sometimes I will do that with the text still on the screen. Sometimes I will remove the text. If it's a text that I feel is not terribly complicated, I will cover it up so that they get in the habit of actually reading and comprehending as they're reading and not always depending on, oh, when he's done, I'll just go back and translate it with my partner. So we go back and forth with whether or not um, we're going to cover the text or leave it visual. If it's a very complex um, section of the story, there's a lot going on or a lot of new vocabulary, then I'm liable to leave it on the screen. If it's something I can think they can easily handle, then I'm not going to leave it on the screen. And then I ask them to tell me, students to tell me one thing that they know is true about this section of the story. I don't want them to feel like they need to tell me everything that's in there. And I want them to tell me what they know so that we focus on what they know rather than dealing with what they don't know. Sometimes when you start with comprehension questions, some students panic because they're like, oh, I don't know that, I'm lost. I'd rather have them volunteer the facts that they know that they were able to pick up and we'll sew that together into a narrative. And then if there are important ideas they've omitted that I want to have included, then I might ask a, a leading comprehension question to draw out that detail or um, uh, it, sometimes if students are really resident, reticent at the beginning of this, you could start by asking some comprehension questions, but um, it works amazingly well for me with my students, even the slower students, the students who aren't the best Latin students, they're all able to listen to it and at least come up with something. Um, if I see they're really struggling, I might ask simple things like, well, who are the characters in this story? Who speaks in this story or where is it? Um, also, by the way, we talk, we're talking earlier off screen about uh, references that no longer um, are valid. And in this story, uh, students don't really know what a miser is anymore, at least not in middle school. So then I started showing them Ebenezer Scrooge until I realized they no longer knew who Ebenezer Scrooge was. So then I tried the heat miser from A Year Without Santa Claus and for that worked for a while. And now... Only about less than half of them know that. So now we've moved on to Mr. Krabs from SpongeBob SquarePants. But hey, it works. All right. Um, let me just double check my notes as to where I am. Okay. Um, I would um, like to say that visuals you can get sometimes by just Googling images, but there's lots of images that are available to, available to you through the text and through the teacher's resource um, guide, whether it was intended for that purpose or not. So here is a nice visual that goes well with this story. In fact, this entire story of Arowis, I was able to put visuals with by stealing them from a teacher resource worksheet that's actually for Felix at Fur. But a lot of those same images work perfectly fine here. I put a little tweak here and there, and um, it really helps um, pep up the presentation. Um, another method is to summarize either a section or an entire story for a class where a teacher will, um, in order to save time, summarize a section of the story, either because the um, they're tight for time or maybe that section of the story is not of prime importance. And there are even certain stories which are not of prime importance, but you shouldn't just skip over them. You should at least summarize them for the students. Um, So um, 
taking this first part of Belemicus Rex, I would probably summarize it by saying something like, <clears throat> in this section, Belemicus is so astonished that he's speechless. Salvia says, well, why are you astonished? You and Cogadubnus never got along, but we're buddies and I owe you. Uh, I'm going to make you king of a kingdom that's bigger than Cogadubnus is. And then Salvius calls for Morgarum. Okay. So that would be my summary, but I wouldn't leave it at that. I would spend another minute by asking students to find for me Latin phrases or sentences in the Latin reading um, that indicate something in particular. So I would say, all right, um, what's the sentence or phrase in this passage that indicates that Polemicus was speechless? And they read through it and they go, oh, ut mm, nihil respondere posset, right? Or what's the uh, sex phrase or sentence that in which Salius claims they're buddies? Okay. I would take either mi amike or in amicitia sumus. That, Sal that Salius owes Belemicus. Uh, that's going to be tibi multum debea, okay? So I'll ask a few of those so that I know that they've been paying attention to the text and not just listening to my summary. And then I can either go on to be summarizing more of the story, or I might go to a completely different method. I might go to the methods I've already met, method I already mentioned uh, with the next section of the story. Um, you can also, uh, if you're trying to move on more rapidly, um, paratranslate a section of a story uh, with uh, a class. Again, if you're tight for time or there's a section that's not of prime importance, um, I probably might put some parentheses up on the board around some of the phrases. And then we would go through and I would um, do a paratranslation for them, maybe calling on them for the phrases if they know them. The slave to whom Salius, he ordered this, at once he went out. Uh, returning in a short time, garum mixed with poison, he poured onto and into the plate of Belemicus. So happy he was when the words of Salvius he heard that he was eating the garum, unaware of the danger of death. How big it is, this kingdom which you have promised. From where in the world is it? Asked Belemicus. So I might do all of that for them. I'm more likely to actually ask students, what's this phrase? What's this word mean? Trying to put it together that way. And then if nobody volunteers, then I'll give it. So that we get through the entire paraphrase. And... This is good because it starts to make them think um, in the way that they should be reading, okay? Not always trying to rearrange the words into English order. Uh, they're going to get much more fluent at reading if they can go through it in the Latin order. And this sort of paratranslating gets them to start thinking about that. <clears throat> okay, so <clears throat> students... I also will have students work in pairs to read sections of the story out loud to each other um, and then um, do the brick by brick compilation of the story with them. So I put this section of the text on the screen. I give them, um, this is very short, so I'd give them a minute to read through it and maybe 30 more seconds to discuss it and then tell me what you got out of this. So they get this exchange. Then we go on to the next exchange, same thing, very brief time. And so on through that story. I will have students sometimes work on that phrasing intentionally by giving them a section of the story and having them mark it up, or we might do it on the screen together. Um, so uh, this is a very variable thing for students. So there aren't necessarily, 
always hard and fast answers. There are certain minimums that I'm looking for, but some students might be able to expand their phrases that they understand, their groupings um, into larger um, sections than others. Um, I might have them phrase this before we read it, during reading it, or after we read it. All of those are possible. Uh, starting from one stage one, they should, I start to make sure that they see prepositional phrases as a natural phrasing of words and, and think of them as being working together and not as separate words. I don't want them to think every sentence is a string of 10 words, vocabulary words that you look up and juggle around. I want them to start seeing that there are certain groups of words that naturally go together and work together. So the first one from stage one, we see our prepositional phrases. Uh, noun adjective pairs are another natural grouping, um, as well as nouns joined by et and other conjunctions. I also myself like to have them notice accusatives that are right next to verbs or adverbs that are in, right next to verbs, because that's a natural pairing. Um, so in this passage, um, I would say I would expect some students to be able to tell me Salvius Kakanans goes together. Um, that third declension with a second declension is sometimes difficult for some students. So if they don't see that, I understand that. Same thing with multus maius. Okay. And uh, I would expect them all to know that Imperium Romanum is going to go together. Some students might go so far as to say, well, I think it should go from Quam through Imperium Romanum. And I would say that's perfectly fine. I would expect my students to be able to see that Kis Weir Beast goes together. But some of my more advanced students might more even more naturally put it together with the Promotus. That's fine. Uh, the nimium bibisti and the mi amike they should see as going together. I would expect everyone to be able to do nullum regnum, although, again, some students might expand that to the noe because that's the verb and those are the two accusatives that go with it. Some students will be able to get that, others are not. So if they get the nullum regnum, I'm, they'll say that's fine, I give you credit for that, absolutely. Later on, you may get to see that that goes together. Um, Imperium Romanum. Regnum Est. Now, <clears throat> some of the really advanced students might see, think of the whole um, relative clause as being a natural phrase. Lots of students aren't there yet. So if they didn't get that, I probably would not make a big deal out of that, but I would certainly compliment the students who were able to do that. Um, the tag of the quote, respondent salvius, regnum est. By this point, they should have seen enough infinitives and uh, the verbs that go with them to understand that that works as together as a phrase. Um, some students, they'll see the accusative with the verb. They may or may not realize that that's another accusative that goes with the verb, depending on the student. Uh, some might even have enough advanced understanding of innate understanding of language to see that the mortorum is actually kind of going with the word king as well. So again, the size and complexity of the phrases vary with the students particular where their particular thinking is linguistically. But as long as they're starting to get these basic phrases like the noun adjective pairs and the prepositional phrases, I think is very important from the start. And um, almost all of my students are able to get those after a, a good amount of practice. Okay. Um, sometimes 
Um, I will have them because they need to practice uh, just reading and answering comprehension questions. Um, so I will uh, sometimes give them a section of the story that they have to read through and then answer a few comprehension questions about it. So here I would ask them, well, what was this section about? What's the major event that starts in that section? Find me a Latin phrase that tells a physical symptom. Find a Latin word or phrase that tells an emotion Belemicus is feeling. And if they can do all of that, then they have a pretty good understanding of this paragraph without having to write out the entire translation in English. And then, of course, after they've been in their pairs and they've read it and answered this, then we will discuss it as a class so that I, we can make sure they're all on the right track. Um, sometimes I will have them read a section of the story and then write their own paraphrase of it um, in Latin. Or you could also probably do it in English. Um, it can be done by not having to look up every single word in the glossary, but by simply pulling out the important words that are in the text. That they see which are the more important ideas and which are just the things that are describing things and adding in details, but not necessarily the main point. So they would go through and try and find, call out the important Latin details and then rewrite it into sentences. There are, there might be some variation in the details they put in and I'm willing to accept that as long as they've got the main points. So some people may think the giving of the groan was really important too, or the poison was painful, that that, you know, that's fine. As long as they get the main points that Polemicus fell down dead, that the slaves burned the course of Polemicus really quickly, get it out of the way. And that Salius used that to persuade the other chieftains to remain loyal. Oh, and sometimes when there's a really nice sentence or picture or twist in a plot from a previous edition, whether it be the fourth edition, the third edition, or the second edition, because I've been through them all, I have no problem adding it back into my story. I love that dramatic, desperate toss of the dagger from Belemicus as he tries to get Salius one last time before he himself dies. Um, Belemicus Rex is also one of those stories where it's great to look back and think about what we've read and maybe some of the clues we might have missed. So at the end of that story, I might ask them to go back and look through some of the other stories and see what did they think about when did Salius and Belemicus start working together? And some of them will come up with stage 24 when Salius asked Belemicus to help track down Dumnorex. Or was it earlier when Belemicus set a bear loose during the big dinner party at the palace of Cogadumnus? I mean, if you think about it, would Belemicus take such a chance of bringing in this wild beast with so many important guests in that room unless someone had promised him protection? Someone important that could give him protection from being prosecuted but for that. Someone like Salius. And in fact, did watching the boat race give Salius the idea of approaching Belemicus for some help when he sees uh, the obvious antagonism between uh, Belemicus and Dumnorix? And the fact that Dorm Dumnorix seems to be a favorite of the king. And then 
after you go to stage 34, you might go back to think of the, go back to this story and think about, well, geez, you know, if Sallys could plot the king's death and then kill his main ally, are we really surprised later on that he rips off his brother-in-law in the shady cemetery plot deal? Or that he arranges a trap for the empress and the death of a famous actor? Yeah, I mean, it's all there. You can see it coming. <clears throat> Uh, another method um, is to do a choral read where everyone is reading uh, a section in unison led by a teacher. It's a good way to get everyone focused on the text, especially on one of those blah days when it, like everyone seems like they're half asleep. You get everyone to stand up, read out loud in the rhythm with the teacher, and it can even be fun to add in emotions. Let's read it first through and then now let's read it like we're all really angry as angry as you can possibly get all right now let's read it as if we're frightened or let's read it as if we're happy see how ridiculous it sounds again getting them engaged in the text in small sections reading it out loud uh, and thinking of it as more than just words um <clears throat> So uh, one way of getting them started off on the idea of writing their own paraphrases or summaries in Latin is to actually do a matching exercise, okay? Um, where students will read a part, a section of the story out loud in Latin with their partner, and then from a list of Latin paraphrases, decide which one appropriately paraphrases the section they just read. So they read this part of the story and then they look through what the Latin paraphrases are and they decide which one it matches up with. In this case, loquax et antiloquax, surduos e willa voca verunt et warica omnes eos inspexit et numerawit. Then they read the next section and decide, okay, what matches up with that. Also, there are in fact two fake paraphrases in the list of choices, so it doesn't boil down to just a simple matching game, that they need to do some thinking and careful reading um, to make sure. Um, also, when they're doing this, the more they stay in the Latin, actually the easier it becomes because it's the Latin, a lot of the Latin phrases you're looking at to see, are they in there? And you don't necessarily have to worry about, do I know exactly what it means? So this kind of gets them working on that idea and dealing with Latin paraphrases so that later on, if you want to have them write their own, like I showed earlier with Polemicus Rex, where they call out the main points and put it together in sentences, they have an idea of what they're heading for. <clears throat> Just take one second. Okay. Um, once a class has uh, read and discussed a story, um, you can always go back to it later for a second reading uh, for some other purpose. So after we've read the story of Tripodes Argentii in each of its sections and understood what it's about, they now have the opportunity to go back and put them into groups of four or five and read it and present it as a play in its entirety. They practice their pronunciation for part of their homework. And then they come in and they might perform in front of the class or they can recite it from their desks. Um, you might have each group do um, the entire play or you might have one group do the first half and a different group do the second half. Uh, but it's a way now that we've done it in sections to make sure that they then go back and can now deal with this story that they have an idea of in its entirety. Um, you can also revisit stories for a second reading to answer uh, larger questions. Uh, so in Tripodibus Argentii, after we've read through it, go back and start talking about, well, 
why does Quintus want to bring a gift to the king? And you can talk all about respect and proper manners and protocol in the ancient world. And how is that reflected in the modern world? Um, if you haven't already talked about antiloquats, what are the two purposes that Salius is using antiloquats for? Was Salius planning to bring a gift to the king all along? Explain how you could figure that out. What in the story gives you evidence about that? What, and why is Salius now so concerned about a gift? Also, you could ask them um, to rewrite a section of uh, the Latin story by changing it in some way. So one challenge is I want you to rewrite this paragraph, these four lines, and I want you to add in three more Latin words when you rewrite it, but those words have to make no major change in the story. It has to be the same basic story, even though you've added those three words in. And then you can do the exact opposite add in three words that then make a significant change to the story. You could have them write the paragraph so it says the opposite of what it just said. And of course, you would limit the use of the word non, so they're just not always saying not, but they're looking for, uh, trying to find antonyms that they know for some of the words they, they have in there and using synonyms for nouns. Um, Or you can write a section saying the same thing, but in other words. Again, using Latin synonyms that they know for the words that are already in there. I also will go back to stories to um, practice and point out grammar points. Um, it's not that we never teach grammar. We just don't want to teach grammar out of context. So now we're going back to the story where we read for Aurus, and I want you to find me the Latin verb for they were hurrying, or he was living, or he was. So that they're practicing finding those perfect and imperfect verbs and looking at the different forms in Latin. You could have them list 12 of the verbs in this section and then write what would be the correct tense translation for that particular uh, verb in this section of the story. Going back to Tripodos Argentii, if I want them to practice infinitives, I would, let's say they're fairly new at infinitives at this point, so I don't want to put them under too much pressure to begin with. I want them to practice first. So I say, find me the infinitives in this first section that are in lines two. Find me one in line seven. Find me one in line eight, one in line nine. So they're not aimlessly wandering through the whole section, but they know somewhere in line two, I've got to find this thing. What is it? What have we learned about it? Then you can step it up a notch and say, all right, so now in this section, there are four infinitives. See if you can find those. So it's not an endless search because they don't know how many it is they're looking for. They know there are four, and now they've got to look until they find those four. And then you can pump it up an additional notch by simply saying, all right, now find all the infinitives in this last section. So again, we're going back to the story. We're using the story as the demonstration of the grammar we want to practice. And we're starting off easy and then ramping up each the complexity each time. Uh, I do a lot of this with um, relative and adverbial clauses. Um, it's, a, it's a big grammatical item for my middle schoolers. So um, I will have them go back and, and find, first I put at the top what the kind of things are they're looking for, what are the markers that help indicate you've got some one of these clauses? What does it begin with? What else does it have to have? What does it do? And then I tell them, same as I did with the infinitives in this first story, here's where you go to find them. And I 
usually have them start in class in pairs. And then if we don't finish, then they will do it for homework. But by then they've had plenty of practice with a partner and they've got plenty of examples to look at on the paper. Then uh, we'll do that for a couple of stories and then we'll get to the point where I'll say, all right, let's see, do you know what some of the markers are? Have you learned them? Fill this in. And if you don't know it off the top of your head, then go back and look at a previous worksheet to find the answers. Um, and then I give them some of the line numbers, but somewhere in the first 14 lines, you have to find the first three in your own. And then after you found the ones in the middle, after line 17, there's three more you need to find. So again, um, they're getting some practice finding it on their own, as well as practice pointing them to where things are. And I think I'm just about done. I don't know if we have time for any um, questions in the chat or not. Absolutely. Okay. People can either put it in the chat or they can ask it out loud. Just remember we are being recorded. So not you, Joe, but everybody else. Joe, does this take a lot of time to prep? The dividing the stories into sections really doesn't. Um, although it is important that you think about the sections that you're putting it into. Like, it shouldn't be random. There should be a main idea that is the focus of that section. So sometimes it's a whole paragraph. Sometimes it's less than a paragraph. But that does not require necessarily a lot of time. Um, when you get to the point where you start adding visuals and figuring out um, questions you want to answer and so, uh, ask and so forth, that can require a little bit more um, lead time. So to follow up on that, if someone's just starting off trying to do some of this, what would you suggest would be the first thing to do so you don't bite off more than you can chew or, and overwhelm yourself? So I would start off by, um, you know, regular prose stories. I would divide them into paragraphs. And okay. And then dialogue, you know, two or three lines. And then when you go back to it the next year, you look at those paragraphs and you think, all right, was this too much for them to bite off? Was there a division where in one part of the paragraph, it seems to be heading toward this idea. And then in the second paragraph, it seems to be moving toward this idea. So I'm going to split those. Um, and the same so with the find the gram language points. You could... Like yeah. that off in little bits too. Right. I probably started off with one worksheet and then the next year I did two more stories with the same idea using that as a pattern. Um, okay. But all of this, again, I did it one step at a time over many years. Um, Brian Baker has asked, how well will these strategies work with using pair decks? Hmm. So I haven't used a lot of Pear Decks. I think it would work, but someone who uses Pear Decks more than I do would probably be better at answering that particular question. Brian, what are you pointing to with the Pear Decks? I mean, having it be that it's activated on the Pear Deck instead of a worksheet? Oh, Brian. I don't know. Yeah. Brian, would you like to unmute and explain a little bit better what we're... Okay. Okay. Is anybody else familiar with using uh, a lot of pair decks? Now, basically, I use the pair decks to build background. That's what he's saying. Okay. So I think Joe's point... Talk to someone that's more aware of that and see how you can apply it. Nicoletta here. Um, okay. I do use Pear Deck a lot. Um, and it's a it's a huge pool of, of resources with Pear Deck on that Excel Excel document that everybody adds to it on Facebook and our group. Um, and a lot of what other teachers have done and I learned from them 
um, it kind of follows the, the steps of this workshop, the big, big grammar points and their um, talking context. A lot of the, the stories are breaking down in smaller pieces. They're, each slide has um, a paragraph with questions, um, highlighting either a grammatical point or vocabulary or paraphrasing. It's pretty much very similar to this. Um, it's available for everybody to look and to use those on, on Facebook and the group. The, the so it sounds group. like it would work well. I, it, it is, I'm, I'm just following, I was following you and I said, well, this is very similar to that. And um, my question would be, um, do you teach all this in one session? Do you use it in one session or considering that you use it towards middle schoolers, right? Yes. Because I, I moved from middle school to high school and, you know, the cognitive skills are a little bit different um, and they can chew a little bit more. Right. But um, I was wondering how much time do you spend, let's say from... Um, one of the, the examples you had, Bellimicus Rex, right? Um, how much time, how many sessions or class times you spend in on order, it? In order to cover that story? Uh-huh. Um, with my, uh, I have two levels in the eighth grade. Everyone in seventh grade is at the same level. And then we have sort of an advanced level and a regular level in the eighth grade. Mm -hmm. uh, with that advanced level, I can cover the story Bolemicus Rex in one period. In session. Mm -hmm. And then I might, like I said, go back to it later for a second reading the next day or later on in the chapter to mm -hmm. do all of the grammatical exercises and so forth. But as far as the actual reading and discussion of the story, I can do it in um in a in a session. Okay. Uh, it went it now I used to do it even quicker than that, and I don't know that I was doing as good a job. So one of the things this did for me is it did make me spend more time on my stories than I was in the past, which, if I'm doing a reading based program, that makes sense. right. because my my always my concern is time and how much time sometimes we get carried away with one story and you realize, that you're behind and you rush with the next one to, to keep mm -hmm. the pace, right? So um, it's always a, a, a little bit of a gamble. And my second uh, question for myself most of the time is, have I spent enough time for them to absorb but guess to recognize the language structure in the story when I'm going back or moving forward? Right. And that's another reason for going back and doing a second reading of a story a week or two later. Mm. Uh, mm. It's always good. And that's good for them, too, to be going back and reviewing. Um, uh, because it helps when they see earlier Latin that they've read before, it, it may help them realize how much they've moved forward. Um, so for one example where I, I might do this is um, um, in the story Rex Spectaculum Dot where mm. um, Quintus at the end takes the spear and kills the bear. Right. Well, night before for homework, I have them reread the story Animal Ferox from Unit 1. And they're able to quickly go through it. And then when we do Rex Spectaculum Dot, uh, we're like, okay, so is it a surprise that Quintus has the skill at the spear? No, uh -huh. we saw that back in this story. So now they've gone back. We read that story and seen all those grammatical points again that were emphasized back in that earlier stage. And then that's also helped them prepare them for the next story they're doing. Mm, correct. Okay. And also when you're covering a story, you know, it's not bad to sometimes have a cliffhanger. Sometimes if you get to that last paragraph and the bell rings and there's a surprise twist ending, it's like, oh, gee, you're going to have to go home and read it and find out and come in and tell me tomorrow. Right. And uh, that just remind me that yesterday with Latin one, we we're reading the um uh, in in stage four, 
mm-hmm. with um in basilica and and they just wanted to hermogenes and they they just flipped the page and wanted to see what's going on next because you know he just ran with the money um and wasn't required but some of them that finished earlier they wanted to see what's going on i mean so we cannot wait until next week we have to do it now yeah. so <laughs> yeah sometimes they want to know what's going on um which is good for us right yes so. definitely yeah and, yeah, and, and when we're presenting these small sections that helps them from sometimes reading and peeking ahead as well correct yeah and yes uh, becky bush she has the best i think paragraphs in that that regard very similar to what you presented today she breaks down the stories and and goes on different levels on those paragraphs somebody put on here i think in the notes yeah the other thing I would say uh, to you, Nicoletta, in terms of, of pacing, with my advanced Latin 8 classes, we cover 34 stages in two years. Mm. So okay. those 7th and 8th graders are doing book 1, 2, and 3 in two years. Uh, in two years. Yeah. I have not. This is my fifth. Well, yes, my fifth year teaching it. I didn't make it that this, this year. I think I was going to do better to get there but i wasn't successful to do all those three books in two years um so i was just and at one point i just i just realized i haven't i don't have to stress um because i'm not gonna i'm not gonna help me so but this year i think i'm a little bit better seems like i don't know yeah <laughs> Well, that again was a journey for me too. I wasn't doing one through 34 the first year I started, right? I started off at one point we were one through 12 and then we were one through 16 and then one through 28 and one through 24 with my advanced levels, one through 28 with my regular levels. Mm. Yeah. Well, and so much of it depends upon what you're talking about when you say a class period. We know that uh, some class periods are 35 minutes, some are 40, some are 50, almost 60 minutes. Right. So there's a lot of factors that go into uh, determining um, a class period. And many right. teachers don't even meet five days a week if you're on a, a block schedule. So a lot of things to consider when you're doing your planning. Joe, yeah. that was really amazing. So many good suggestions. Thank you so much. Uh, before we end, does anybody have a last question or comment for Joe? Yes, I, I do have a question. Uh, you were referring to something called Paradex, and I'm not familiar with that. Uh, is it spelled P-A-R-A-D-E-X? Is that right? No, it's P-E-A-R-D-E-C-K, one word. It's an online um, slide program, but it has a lot of capabilities to it. Um, and if, as we said, other people have made up a lot of them, so you just have to be able to run them, you know. I, I'm sorry, could you spell it once more? P as in Peter, E A R. D as in dog, E C K, and it's one word, pear deck. Pear deck, okay. Then, well, Great. It doesn't sound like it should be that, but it is. <laughs> and uh, I suppose I can find out all about it on Google. Just that's true. Okay. Great. Yeah. And, yeah. And Brian has shared a um document that teachers have put together that have lots of different resources and there are pair decks already made up on there the only thing we always suggest you do when you use somebody else's stuff is to take a moment and look at it and make sure it's correct you know because we we have no control over what it's it's truly a, a teacher collaborative effort so brian put that in the uh, notes thank you Anybody else? All right, thank you everyone for being here this evening. As you can tell, we have recorded this, which I'm gonna stop right now.